So we'll start now the, the second panel, which is on identifying migrant vulnerabilities, structural and situational factors of vulnerability. My name is Lalana, I'm from PECOM. It's the platform for international cooperation on undocumented migrants. We're a network of organizations working for the rights of undocumented migrants. We have about 150 member organizations in different countries. And um, we, um, yes, for us it's incredibly important to be invited. We thank very much the organizers to have us on this panel because we look at the structural and situational factors which make an undocumented person in a situation of risk or vulnerability. It was mentioned very many times this morning by some of the speakers that it, vulnerability is not inherent or intrinsic to any individual. It's about the policies and the situations that people are in. And when you look at undocumented migrants, we often see that actually irregular status itself becomes a factor, becomes something which can be a characteristic to put somebody in a situation of risk. Because if they are not able to access essential services, if they're not able to go to the doctor, if they're not able to trust authorities, if they're not be able, able to go to the police, then they're in a situation where they are a zero risk victim um, of exploitation and violence. And these are the structural factors which actually impose situations of risk and vulnerability on individuals that are not necessarily vulnerable otherwise. So this is where we would also like to focus our attention when we talk about vulnerability. What are the actual risk factors and how can we try to prevent those situations of risk? How can we mitigate the risks of people in those situations? And then how can we help to get them out of those situations? situations. So we have a very distinguished panel here today. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, we're going to ask each of the speakers to speak for maximum seven or eight minutes. We saw this morning there was a lot of demand for people to speak from the floor, a lot of desire to have a really interesting debate and discussion. So we'll ask the speakers to try and keep it brief. And um, so we'll he hear first from Dr. Anna Makakala who's the Commissioner General for Immigration Services at the Immigration Services Department of the United Republic of Tanzania. Prior to that, Dr. Makakala was Commandant of the Tanzania Regional Immigration Training Academy in Moshi, and she has a Doctorate of Business Administration at the University of Gloucestershire with areas of specialization in international human migration and development. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, panelists, distinguished participants. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, give a small presentation about identifying migrant vulnerabilities, structural and uh, situational factors of vulnerabilities in the context of Tanzania. My presentation will uh, touch a little bit about understanding of vulnerable migrants in the context of Tanzania, instruments that guide management of vulnerable uh, migrants in Tanzania, factor that contributed to migration of uh, vulnerable migrants, uh, impact that they have uh, on, on the side of migrants and on the side of the government, uh, challenges of identifying and management of vulnerable migrants, and also I will give some recommendations on assistance and protection of vulnerable migrants. Next, please, the slide. Okay. First slide, please. So uh, I would like to give uh, an overview of understanding of vulnerable migrants. First, we have to ask ourselves who is vulnerable migrants. There's no common definition of vulnerable migrants, but depending on our side at Tanzania, we define vulnerable migrants if, uh, is any foreign uh, national uh, rather than prohibited migrants who needs protection or assistance. And this can be a victim of trafficking, can be a asylum seeker who needs to have protection of seeking for, 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 for refugees, uh, unaccompanied migrants, child or uh, someone minor separated from the parents and also uh, elderly uh, lactating uh, pregnant uh, women migrants. 
and this in terms of age and sex most become vulnerable migrants. Next please. Does instruments guide management of vulnerable migrants? Tanzania uh, Immigration Service Department is guided by and is mandated by both national and international laws. So in order also to identify uh, vulnerable migrants, we use different national laws in Tanzania. And one of them is Constitution of United Republic of Tanzania of 1977 as amended from time to time. This is uh, 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 normally emphasized on the human rights. So it doesn't matter who uh, is coming from, whether it's a uh, migrant in the Tanzania or citizen, but we have to emphasize human rights for everyone. And also we have constitution for Zanzibar of 1984 as amended, and we have more different uh, domestic and international law that guides for or help to, to protect these vulnerable migrants. Next, please. And also we have uh, Immigration Act, CAP 54, revised edition of 2002, and it is regulation of 1997, which provides condition of, and as criteria for refusal entry, conditions for entry uh, and the stay in the country, uh, specify designated entry and exit points for uh, travelers to enter the country, and also uh, provide or stipulated types of visa, residence, permit, and the other. And also, uh, the, the, the act outlines immigration offenses and penalties. So this also helped to identify vulnerable migrants. And also, we have uh, different acts, or we have national laws. Uh, as I mentioned there, there are so many, but I won't go one, and, uh, I don't have much time. But we have also passport and other travel documents act of 2002 and it is regulation of 2004, Anti-Trafficking in Person Act of 2000, uh, 2008, which also provide elements of identified trafficking in persons, which also easy to identify these vulnerable migrants because most of them are those who are trafficked by other people. They become vulnerable when they come into the country. Next, please. Uh, you can see we, there we have Tanzania Refugee Act of 2002, and most of refugees in the country become vulnerable migrants. So that's also we identify people who are vulnerable in the countries, mostly migrant. Uh, identification. Uh, Tanzania Immigration, also we have uh, Tanzania Immigration Standard Operating Procedures. This also helped to identify vulnerable migrants, most vulnerable persons, and also uh, give ca categories of vulnerable persons, and also ethical contact of immigration functionaries when dealing with vulnerable migrants. So this is like a procedural, but also gives directives on how to identify these vulnerable migrants in the country. Next, please. Um, identification of vulnerable migrants and their treatment is concern of global community as a result of uh, liberalization of the economy as um, resulted into increase in human interaction as migrants have opportunity to move in the country for various factors. Globalization, uh, for example, development of uh, ICT makes more easy communication for people to interact and also to travel from one place to another but this also make movement of people, migration more, more, more massive than before. But also uh, these people when they travel, some of them, they, they travel for business, they travel for employment and other activity education, but some of them they fall into the category of illegal migrants. So uh, when you look at this, when you say most of those who fall into categories of illegal migrants, also they engage themselves into the uh, transnational organized crimes uh, such as uh, trafficking in persons, smuggling, money laundering, cybercrime, drug abuse, and piracies, which also uh, facilitated these people to become vulnerable migrants. Uh, in, in Tanzania, although we facilitate movement of people, but we put sec uh, security as a priority, 
Tanzania Immigration Department is aligning itself at ensuring that we facilitate and at the same time we control movement of persons. So we control uh, movement of persons for undesirable migrants and also we facilitate people to move for those who we, uh, we think or we find they are desirable in the country. Uh, identification of uh, vulnerable migrants is, conduct is conducted professionally by immigration officers at the point of entries by using uh, different techniques. Uh, uh, if I, I go quick, uh, as someone gets into the airport, we normally uh, do uh, details of travelers by checking uh, uh, passengers' manifest and also we examine or scrutinize passport or any travel documents, compare these travel documents, photograph and different uh, other, other uh, traveling documents. <coughs> Another, please. We have many procedures for, for identifying uh, migrants, uh, vulnerable migrants, but first we start at the entry of point, that is the phase one, but also we continue to identify these vulnerable migrants once they've entered the country uh, while staying in the country. A determinant of uh, migrants' vulnerability, uh, we have different levels. I'm trying to go quick because I've been yes. too, <laughs> yes, I don't have much time. Yeah. Uh, factors that are um, determinant of migrant vulnerability, we have these uh, different levels. At the level of individual, household, community, and structure, or we can say national level. When you look at these uh, uh, factors, you see people are affected mostly like uh, uh, religions or economic level or political issues. Uh, suppose the country's political uh, stability is not good or, or there's a political agitation, then this means it affects from the level of uh, individual or household until to the level of national. Uh, so uh, we have impact uh, that's caused by these vulnerable migrants. If, uh, if vulnerable migrants or migration is not uh, properly uh, managed, they can be agent of jeopardizing national security. As I said before, security is the first priority, but we are there for facilitating uh, movement of persons, and we look after all these vulnerable migrants in the country. The entire process for the identification of uh, needs of uh, migrants needs time and needs uh, uh, financial resources because uh, it's not just the immigration department but there are other uh, national institutions or legal institutions which are involved to identify all these vulnerable migrants. And then this challenge, another challenge is that uh, uh, the country or the immigration department services is facing as I said before, it's budget constraints because we need committee and which involve other, other uh, national, in, national institutions to meet and do their job to identify this and also to have a strategy. So it, it takes time and also financial constraints. Next. And also, uh, uh, we have challenges of language barrier between immigration functionaries or uh, uh, these national uh, institutions with vulnerable migrants because of communication barrier. Once we want to identify them, communication becomes a barrier, and then it takes time for the for the vulnerable to be for the vulnerable migrants to be identified. Uh, given the essence of uh, managing and identifying vulnerable migrants at national and international level, there is a need for the government and other development partners to collaborate by providing education and the travelers, uh, education to travelers to know the migration policy before they migrate, because most of them, they migrate unprepared, so they miss this to have a proper document and then they fall into the categories of uh, uh, vulnerable migrants. And also, uh, we need to establish holding centers to protect the vulnerable migrants. But as I said before, uh, uh, the country faces financial constraints. So some of these vulnerable uh, migrants, while in the countries, do not have basic needs which they are supposed to have. 
So the, uh, we, we urge for international organization and other development partners to support the needs and the right of vulnerable migrants. It's not the duty of one country. Thank you. And so, so thank you very much. Thank you. And sorry for rushing you with the time, but it means that we should have time to hear from the others. So moving swiftly on, um, our next speaker is Ms. Kohlberg, the Deputy Secretary General at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway, responsible for overall administration, budget and security matters. Thank you, Chair. I would like to start by thanking IOM for the invitation to participate in this dialogue on the very important, timely and complex topic today. Before addressing some of the guiding questions for this specific panel, I would like to make a more general comment on the use of the term vulnerable. There is a need to remind each other that most of today's migration is legal, voluntary and positive for the people concerned, the countries of origin and destination. The way we talk about migration and migrants influences public perception and debate and in turn national policies. It is important to remember and to express clearly that migrants are not vulnerable per se. Although many are vulnerable, we cannot generalize about migrants as if it were one homogeneous group across the globe. I was thus happy to hear the opening remarks of Director General Swing this morning. Vulnerability especially occurs in relation with irregular migration, typically along various points of the migratory routes, often crossing several countries. In my view, it is therefore more precise and more fruitful to debate migrants in vulnerable situations. The reason for this is not to minimize the magnitude and seriousness of the topic we are discussing, but on the contrary to build a stronger case for the vulnerable migrants that we do need to address. Last year, the UN member states committed at the highest political level to address the special needs of those who end up in vulnerable situations within large movements of refugees and migrants. Norway stands by its commitment in the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. But how we address vulnerability will be a key question in the process of developing successfully the two global compacts. We believe the following points deserve attention. First, we need to retain the clear distinction between refugees and migrants. As stated in the New York Declaration, refugees and migrants face many common such challenges and may ex experience similar vulnerabilities, but as groups they are governed by separate legal frameworks, and we believe this principle must be upheld. Minimizing the difference will not provide more protection to migrants in vulnerable situations. We must distinguish between the need for international protection that refugees have and the needs that migrants in particular vulnerable situations are facing. Second, we need to underline the existing bodies of law that relate to the protection and assistance to migrants. The background paper for this dialogue rightly reminds us not only of the human rights of all migrants, but also of the protocols related to smuggling and trafficking, as well as relevant labor law provisions. In particular situations, there are also other relevant frameworks such as environmental law, international disaster response law, and in situations of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, as well as national legislation and regional instruments and soft law approaches. I believe that the main challenge for the international com community is our obligation to implement the existing legal frameworks we need to realize the potential and intention of these bodies of law. A non-binding new framework such as a compact cannot replace legally binding commitments and should not aspire to do so. 
What we need to do is to look for stronger international commitment for monitoring and accountability. Thirdly, we must get better at understanding and identifying vulnerability. We share this goal with IOM and we appreciate your efforts to promote a more nuanced understanding of the concept of vulnerability. This can help us identify the vulnerable, who are those most in need of international attention and assistance. It can also help us to use the available resources more efficiently. In a time when needs grow faster than resources, this is needed if we want to make a real difference through this process. Moving on, we have a few questions concerning the model that IOM has proposed for identifying mi migrant vulnerabilities. We believe the intention behind their proposal is good, namely to reach those who fall through the gaps between existing frameworks. Still, we are concerned that by broadening the scope and covering too much ground, we risk diverting attention and in turn financing away from those who need it most. Their proposal includes a large spectrum of factors, from the individual to the international level, including history, geography, politics and economy, when assessing vulnerability. If this model is to become a useful tool for practitioners in the field, how will they be able to take all of this into account? And maybe, more importantly, if this model is meant to serve as input to guidelines for states and other stakeholders in the field of migration on a national level, how do we avoid weakening the implementation of existing frameworks through the proposal of new ones? My questions must not be interpreted as minimizing the fact that people are falling between the nets of existing frameworks and that there are vulnerable migrants in need of strengthened and coordinated international effort. We recognize this and Norway believes we must work to address it. But I think there are examples that could guide us. In order to reduce the possible risk of trying to cover too much ground, we should look to examples that have been developed and deployed in order to solve specific on-the-ground challenges. Most of them have in common that they have been government-led, non-binding, practical and context-specific. The rally around them is an indication that this approach might be an effective way of addressing particular situations of vulnerability. The Nansen Initiative, led by Switzerland and Norway, is an example of how it was possible to address a specific protection gap, in this case related to disaster-induced cross-border displacement. This work is now being followed up by Germany and Bangladesh through the platform on disaster displacement. Another example is the Migrants in Countries in Crisis initiative led by the United States and the Philippines. And the African countries are now working on a freedom of movement protocol, which is another promising regional initiative. To sum up, and looking ahead towards the development of the actual Global Compact on Migration, Norway would like to see a continued distinction between refugees and migrants in general, a strong emphasis on the implementation of existing legal frameworks, and references to good examples and concrete proposals from the field and space for local and regional solution to identify and address specific protection gaps. A clearly spelled out, as clearly spelled out in the New York Declaration, we are determined to saving lives and contributing to a solution-based approach towards a global compact that reduces vulnerabilities and empowers migrants. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if another example that we could look at as well is the direction which the, ch the protection of children in migration movement has been going, because there we have also seen the Committee on the Rights of the Child had its day of general discussion in 2012 on the rights of all children in the context of international migration. And there they really found that the, the, the protection frameworks in place for the different statuses or categories of children meant that children were falling through the gaps. And so in order to, to address this, 
they really affirm the need for a rights-based approach. And so maybe it kind of can relate to what you're saying about also implementing the existing frameworks and what a lot of the, the participants have been stressing today around the need to really address risks and vulnerabilities on an individual and rights-based approach through implementing the existing human rights legislation that we have, because that was how the committee approached the issue of migrant children to say actually rather than looking at particular individual um, or particular status-based or category-based legal definitions of what protection children might need, we need to look at the individual child, we need to do an individual assessment, we need to look at all the factors that are involved. So this could be something that we could look at within this context as well. Um, our next speaker will be um, Ms. Castro de Bolig from Peru, who is the Director of Protection and Assistance to Nationals at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, para mí es un honor eh, encontrarme eh, esta tarde con ustedes y poderme dirigir eh, a, esta, a este grupo de de asistentes. Eh, agradezco ante todo a la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones por la invitación para participar en estos diálogos. La gestión de una migración regular, ordenada y segura requiere la promoción de respuestas eficaces y coherentes a las necesidades de protección y asistencia de los migrantes en situación de vulnerabilidad. A partir de la experiencia peruana, compartiré con ustedes la estrategia de intervención con peruanos que desean migrar a los Estados Unidos para trabajar como pastores ovejeros. Los pastores ovejeros son ciudadanos peruanos con destreza y conocimiento en la crianza de, de ovejas. Por lo general son eh, población indígena. En términos generales, entendemos que la vulnerabilidad se produce a partir de la sumatoria de una fragilidad social y de las fragilidades personales o de grupo. Por fragilidad, hago referencia a la falta de recursos, habilidades y accesos por causas estructurales o coyunturales, que dificultan una toma de decisiones adecuadas, disminuyen las oportunidades de una persona para desarrollar un proceso migratorio seguro y merman su capacidad de respuesta y defensa frente a una amenaza. Esta fragilidad es determinante pues significa una mayor exposición frente a posibles abusos, menores recursos y capacidades para su defensa, y afecta la posibilidad de que cada persona pueda lograr cumplir con los objetivos de su proceso migratorio. El reto de la política pública, en este caso de la Cancillería peruana, es fortalecer los contextos sociales, culturales, normativos, entre otros, para aumentar las capacidades de decisión y actuación de los migrantes, para disminuir su fragilidad personal. Para ello, se debe tener en cuenta que la vulnerabilidad es diversa y tiene al menos dos ámbitos que debemos considerar. El primero, no todos los migrantes comparten las mismas vulnerabilidades, es decir, no todos los migrantes son iguales. Ser niño, ser mujer, ser adulto, ser mayor, existen vulnerabilidades compartidas, pero también estas van a variar entre un grupo y otro. Por ejemplo, un migrante con VIH comparte las vulnerabilidades de las personas migrantes y suma aquellas de las personas portadoras del virus. Segundo, dentro de un mismo grupo, la situación de vulnerabilidad no es homogénea. Se debe tener en cuenta la interseccionalidad, es decir, la sumatoria de condiciones que marcan las diferencias al interior de los grupos. No es igual ser mujer indígena migrante que ser una mujer indígena migrante adulta de la tercera edad. En el caso de los pastores ovejeros, eh, se presenta una situación muy interesante. Para identificar las vulnerabilidades, el Estado peruano ha desarrollado un triple ejercicio de análisis. El primero, un análisis de vulnerabilidades de su condición de migrante. Son personas con desconocimiento de códigos lingüísticos, culturales, normativos, sociales, legales, laborales y una falta de redes de contención a nivel social. Es decir, no poseen 
alrededor de ellos, familia, amigos o contactos a nivel personal. Segundo, el análisis de la interseccionalidad con la situación de los trabajadores agrícolas. Trabajan en lugares aislados, bajo duras condiciones climáticas, sin fácil acceso a servicios de salud, telecomunicaciones, etc. Tercero, el análisis de la población en concreto. Nos encontramos frente a una población indígena rural con un nivel de escolarización básico, probablemente analfabetos tecnológicamente, con patrones lingüísticos y culturales diferentes y con muy poco acercamiento a las instancias estatales y mucho menos a las instancias consulares. Bajo dicho análisis de vulnerabilidades, el Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores del Perú vino optando por una estrategia de prevención que llega hacia las poblaciones de las zonas andinas para atender la situación de vulnerabilidad en su origen. Se pueden destacar tres acciones. La primera, conjuntamente con la sección consular de la Embajada de los Estados Unidos de América en el país, se han realizado foros informativos en la misma región de donde provienen los pastores ovejeros, en Huancabelica, con el propósito de informar a las autoridades y a los representantes de las comunidades campesinas locales sobre los derechos laborales, las condiciones de trabajo, los riesgos en el reclutamiento, los requisitos migratorios, todo esto con el fin de evitar posibles violaciones a derechos o situaciones de indefensión a causa de la desinformación. Segundo, desde el año 2000 se cuenta con un servicio de registro administrativo de los contratos de esta población. Esta, eh, este registro consiste en una ficha de datos básicas que incluye la ubicación, el lugar de empleo en los Estados Unidos y de los familiares en el Perú. Asimismo, la suscripción de un poder en castellano y en inglés, para que en un futuro la autoridad consular esté en capacidad de asistirlo y de protegerlo. Tercero, una cartilla en la cual se hace de conocimiento del trabajador sus derechos y sus obligaciones y los datos de contacto del cónsul y los teléfonos de emergencia de los consulados. Tercera acción, las oficinas consulares cuentan con las fichas de datos básicos a fin de desarrollar acciones de acompañamiento y protección. De lo anteriormente señalado, deseo dejar algunos comentarios a modo de conclusión para reflexionar en conjunto. No existe una definición comprensiva de vulnerabilidades. No se pueden fortalecer los contextos, es decir, mejorar las leyes, adoptar medidas, si no se incrementan a la par los recursos personales para la toma de decisiones y la acción. Eh, en este caso, es importante recordar lo que dijo la representante de, de Sierra Leona de la importancia que tiene la educación. Tercero, es necesario identificar la diversidad de vulnerabilidades para cada uno de nuestros grupos de intervención. En este caso he tenido la oportunidad de hablar de los pastores ovejeros, pero también será necesario hacer el ejercicio respecto a otros grupos, como las mujeres, los niños o los adultos mayores. Cuarto, la diversidad de la vulnerabilidad no solo debe ser tomada en cuenta para identificar las situaciones a corregir, sino también deben ser consideradas para el diseño de las estrategias de intervención, promoviendo la adaptabilidad en cuanto al idioma, símbolos culturales, imágenes fenotípicas, edad, género, etc. También será importante fortalecer las capacidades locales para poder replicar y adaptar culturalmente estas acciones. La intervención oportuna es aquella que previene, más que aquella que reacciona. En ese sentido, los estados, en particular los de origen y los de destino, deben apuntar a fortalecer los mecanismos de información previos al viaje y brindar opciones para el desarrollo de capacidades y habilidades para el mejor desenvolvimiento en el proceso migratorio. Y último, siendo que el proceso de movilidad requiere necesariamente una acción conjunta de países de origen y de destino, es fundamental promover y consolidar mecanismos de cooperación. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.
lots of really, really essential points uh, coming out of that. Um, intersectionality, really good to hear empowerment coming back into the conversation because that was raised a few times this morning as well as one of the, the critical levers to ensure participation and migrants actually being able to defend their own rights and get themselves out of any kind of situation of, of vulnerability. Um, but also then needing the policy framework to be in place so that they can also access those rights if they have the information and they have the possibility to actually go and access justice and remedies if, if they do have that um, information and the right because of the policy framework. Um, so the fourth speaker, we will go swiftly on to Ms. Ortiz from El Salvador. She is the Executive Director of the Salvadorian Institute for Comprehensive Protection of Children and Adolescents, where she's been working on programs such as the City of Children and Adolescents Country Program. Buenas tardes. Bueno, los países del Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica y del cual El Salvador es parte, se enfrentaron a una situación en el año 2014 denominada crisis de la niñez migrante no acompañada. El Salvador, con una población de un poco más de 6 millones, tres de ellos compatriotas residen en el exterior y más de 1.900.000 en Estados Unidos. Desde que inician la ruta migratoria, las personas que exponen a diferentes situaciones que las colocan en riesgo de sufrir violaciones a sus derechos humanos. Por lo anterior, se considera que los grupos de migrantes en situación de mayor vulnerabilidad son las niñas, niños y adolescentes que viajan no acompañados o separados, mujeres y población LGTBI, exponiéndose a la trata de personas, al tráfico de personas, a la discapacidad física producto a imputaciones en el trayecto, a la crisis emocional debido a las violaciones sufridas durante el viaje, ejecución de redadas, la persecución a las personas migrantes que se encuentran de forma irregular en Estados Unidos. Esto ha provocado que las personas se limiten a salir de sus hogares por temor a ser deportados. Como consecuencia, esta situación genera menos ingresos a esta familia y se pueden ver limitados en sus gastos. Esto impacta también a la familia del país de origen en el caso de El Salvador. A raíz de la crisis humanitaria y del flujo de retornados, se, se activa el sistema de protección tanto para adultos como para niñez y adolescencia. Las diferentes instituciones crean con el apoyo de OIM y ANUR, un protocolo de protección y atención de niñez y adolescencia migrante salvadoreña que establece e implementa procedimientos interinstitucionales desde la fase previa, durante y después del retorno para garantizar la atención de quienes se encuentran en situación de vulnerabilidad. De igual forma, se han ido creando condiciones de atención de forma integral a través de los siguientes programas. Atención a niñez y adolescencia y su familia migrante retornada, que consiste en garantizar los derechos de la niñez y la adolescencia migrante mediante acciones sistemáticas en su entorno familiar y comunitario, en el cual desde junio del 2014 a la fecha se han atendido en esta modalidad a más de 10.806 niñas y niños y adolescentes. El otro programa es respecto a la atención para adultos y unidades familiares migrantes. El país cuenta con el programa El Salvador es tu casa, el cual consiste en facilitar procesos de retorno digno que promuevan el empoderamiento y la autonomía socioeconómica de la población retornada. En especial, que hoy en estos momentos el riesgo de deportaciones desde los Estados Unidos Está muy clara que más de 227 mil salvadoreños de estos, 190 mil que están amparados en el estatus de protección temporal TPS pueden ser deportados. Me encuentro especialmente convencida que debe velarse prioritariamente por el interés superior de las niñas y niñas y adolescentes migrantes, 
bajo estándares de derecho internacional en materia de derechos humanos. En muchos de los países del mundo se procede a las deportaciones e incluso a operativos de detención a migrantes sin ninguna condición diferenciada, sin atender los principios básicos de los derechos humanos, en horas inapropiadas o en algunos casos bajo el engaño. Ante esta dura realidad que enfrentamos muchos países, es necesario construir, respetar y posicionar desde la comunidad internacional mejores mecanismos que garanticen los derechos humanos de la población migrante y de forma muy particular de aquellas personas que enfrentan situaciones de mayor vulnerabilidad. Existen 17.512 niñas y niños y adolescentes de los cuales serán deportados a nuestro país. Y para eso, OIM, YANUR y otras nos están ayudando a preparar las mejores condiciones. Ante esta problemática se proponen posibles soluciones, que es velar por el interés superior de la niñez y la adolescencia migrante, especialmente por los que viajan no acompañados, separados, mediante un abordaje sistémico de las instituciones responsables, posicionar los mecanismos existentes y promover la construcción de otros que garanticen los derechos humanos de la población migrante, particularmente de aquellas personas que enfrentan situaciones de vulnerabilidad. Fortalecimiento de los estados, de las instituciones y de la sociedad civil que promuevan el diseño y ejecución de políticas públicas para la atención y cumplimiento de los derechos de las personas migrantes. Promover campañas publicitarias de prevención para desalentar la migración irregular, informando sobre los riesgos y las diferentes vulneraciones que pueden sufrir durante el tránsito migratorio. La protección de los derechos de las personas migrantes constituye un reto inminente para los países de la región, cuya dimensión y vulnerabilidad agrega complejidad de la atención. Agradezco por este espacio proporcionado, las experiencias y debate nos hacen profundizar sobre las acciones más correctas que debemos de tomar en nuestro país. Así que muchas gracias. Thank you very much. One of the questions we have also for this panel is um, what are the health determinants of uh, and vulnerabilities of migrant populations? So something that was coming out from what you were saying there really also about the constant risk of, of deportation and the impact that that has on on the well-being of migrants and families, um, also in terms of their income generation, their, their living and working conditions, um, and the impact that can have on their health. Um, our final speaker, last but not least, is uh, Mr. N uh, uh, Nop Akun, excuse me if I don't say that right, Director of the Social Division, um, Department of International Organizations, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Thailand. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Keith. Um, I'm the last speaker. I'm not sure if I would have any more interesting uh, issues to, to, to raise, but uh, since I'm given eight minutes, ten minutes, um, I'll just try to be brief. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to IOM. And very glad to be back uh, in Geneva. Um, just a, an advice for all of my fellow diplomats that it all, it's always a pleasure to come back to a post that you've had a good working relationship with organizations such as IOM. Um, returning to your own country, you get to learn about the practical, on-the-ground uh, cooperation that you have with organizations uh, that deal with migrants, like the IOM, or refugees, like the UNHCR. And it's always a pleasure and it's always a, a blessing. So just to start off first, um, of course, the context in each country would be very, very much different. For Thailand, it would, in my country, it would be very much different from the context that we have in Norway, Tanzania, Peru, or El Salvador. We have more of the unskilled migrant labor population, numbering around three to five million uh, in our country, um, which is actually very important to our economy. So the structural uh, factors and conditions come into play. Uh, this, uh, the migrant community is very, very important for Thailand's economies, especially in the fishing and industry uh, sector. And uh, as a to, to address the, this need and to address this population that is very important to us, a lot of integration has been going on. If you go to Thailand these days, you would see uh, ATM machines with uh, screens coming up with uh, languages of our neighboring countries or in banks or in hospitals catering to the needs of the migrant community. Um, 
in terms of uh, prevention and protection of uh, various abuses, there has been uh, efforts to um, uh, find uh, interpreters and uh, language uh, facilitators in terms of the uh, labor inspectors as well. So it's kind of across the board in, in every, every sector. But firstly, to go back to de definition first, um, I guess the simplest way to talk about vulnerability is just to quote what uh, the director from uh, Peru had mentioned, that uh, is very diverse. The simplest way to look at vulnerability is to look at it on the, in the widest perspective. That vulnerability comes in any situation, in many situations, uh, very diverse situations, in different times, in different ways, and in different factors. So therefore, the, the, the wider, uh, comp the more comprehensive look that we have on vulnerability, the wider vulnerability lenses that we have, um, the easier it would be to identify those who are vulnerable, and the easier it would be also to protect those who are vulnerable, including uh, migrants. For Thailand's case, vulnerability mostly would mean uh, migrants who are victims of human trafficking, as well as unaccompanied uh, children. Uh, that's the uh, structural part. For the situational factors, um, the human trafficking victims in, in Thailand, uh, of course, they don't cover only migrants, it would be Thai citizens as well. But uh, what we have been doing is a very comprehensive uh, approach, the five Ps the, in terms of policy, protection, prevention, um, in, terms, in terms of uh, providing uh, and partnership, in terms of providing the best uh, care for trafficking victims, as well as those who are uh, abused when they come into, into the country. Now, I talked about the three to five million uh, labor migrants in Thailand, of course, uh, one of the most important focus starts from the beginning. It starts from the word uh, safe migration. We've had cooperation projects with IOM on safe migration, information uh, awareness campaigns. Now, safe migration is there as a preventive uh, measure uh, because migrants are always vulnerable to uh, abuse all along the way since they're, um, the reason that they leave the country, since what they encounter in the, in the country, or the specific aspects in terms of their gender um, and ethnicity. So it starts from ethical recruitment processes. It starts from the, co the ethical contracts. It starts from preventing them from becoming victims of trafficking and also becoming uh, victim to debt bondage uh, and having their rights abused, abused or in terms of uh, low wages and, and, and things like that. So, so it's a whole gamut of of issues that they are uh, facing. But in Thailand, uh, this sort of uh, issues, uh, like in any country, they exist. But it's not because of age or sex or discrimination. But it's, it's because of the situational factors that they're in. So I believe that if you classify situational factors as, you know, every type of country would be different, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have countries with, with um, vulnerable migrants in, in conflict situations all the time, of course. It might be the, uh, some economic factors or the situational factors that, that cause them to be uh, abused or, uh, or fall victims to human trafficking. So, so in summary for the first part, I would say that uh, structurally and situational factors, um, it, 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 it comes as, as, as it is. It's, it's in inevitable. It, it comes even in times of, of, of peace, of course. Um, and I believe that uh, we would have to uh, classify, we have to say that these migrants are in vulnerable situations, not vulnerable migrants, because mo migrants are not vulnerable in, in, in themselves. And these situations are either there already in the, uh, because of their uh, entry into the country, because of the economic factors, and because of the whole uh, setup of, of the country. So, which caused them, unfortunately, to be in vulnerable uh, situations. Um, for, for Thailand, um, we've been working on um, a lot of uh, domestic reform uh, to address uh, these uh, issues, including the Labor Protection Act, uh, the, the latest one, uh, which has been effective in earlier this year, which increases the penalty for child labor, for using child labor, and covers issues such as management of uh, the migrant issue, registration, uh, and believe me, we've been doing a lot of registration uh, in terms of prevention, protection, remedy, and law enforcement. Um, as well as some um, engagement with uh, stakeholders to ensure that migrants receive uh, equal rights according to human rights principles and labor and uh, social rights. Um, what uh, we need and what uh, many countries would need, of course, is an integrated uh, agency. Because for Thailand right now, 
um, it's not so much integrated in terms of the, the migrant issue. There's one agency handling registration, and you can imagine registration of three to five million legal, illegal migrants, uh, irregular migrants, and all, all different types of migrants. That would be a difficult task, and it actually has been continuing for, for many years. Um, registering and extending the deadline and coming back again and things like that. So, so uh, an integrated agency that deals both with registration as well as the rights, uh, the protection, the ensuring of rights of migrants has, has to be un under one roof. But at the, at, at the current moment, um, that's not what is happening in Thailand and, and other countries as well. But nevertheless, we've been focusing on the issue of migrant health, um, the universal health coverage that is uh, available for Thai citizens also covers migrants. Um, in terms of education as well, but not so much yet on language training because um, perhaps there's no need because most of the migrants coming into Thailand uh, uh, come from countries that have a similar um, language background from Thailand. So the integration is quite easy in terms of, of, of language. Um, I guess for every country, the balance with uh, secure, national security issues and management of migrants and benefits of migrants, rights of migrants, has, has to come into play. So it's kind of a, dif a difficult balancing act for many countries. We want to ensure and protect uh, vulnerable migrants. At the same time, there are things you have to do in, inside your country. So how do we reconcile reconcile that? There's, there was a new migrant act, that uh, migrant regulation that came uh, into effect uh, last month in Thailand. And the repercussion was that most of the legal migrants got uh, afraid. They were kind of uh, afraid that they, would, they, they, they didn't register correctly or they didn't have the proper documents. So, so this started actually a repercussion, a, an, an effect that there was a sort of like a mini mass exodus you know, of, of migrant labor from Thailand going back to their countries. You know. so, so it's kind of like um, the balancing act is kind of difficult. We need uh, migrants, uh, migrants need jobs. At the same time, when we try to enforce the law, we, write, we try to register it causes uh, some sort of anxiety among the migrant population. And of course, uh, it would mean the lack of, uh, the lowering of, of confidence. So that's one issue that we had, had faced. Um, I'll come back to that a bit later, but uh, to, to move on to the issue of the GCM, of course, we talked about the New York Declaration, the Global Compact on, on Migrants. Um, basically, there are uh, six um, clusters of uh, issues uh, that we are, uh, looking into, uh, I believe it includes uh, smuggling, uh, human rights, uh, repatriation of funds, as well as sustainable development. And these are the main six issues that uh, countries around the world are looking into right now and trying to discuss with stakeholders and to come out as a regional, uh, uh, discuss at a regional meeting and at the end to feed into the, the global discussion that would start in uh, January next year, I believe. And, and Thailand was one of those countries that it was selected. And we're working closely with the IOM right now to have uh, stakeholder meetings in three or four provinces to iron out uh, the most important issues among these six issues for migrants in, in Thailand, migrant laborers in Thailand. And of course, to insert uh, the issue of vulnerability of, uh, ultimately uh, into the global compact on, on, on migrants. Now, how do we do that? Uh, inserting the issue of vulnerability, highlighting vulnerability in the GCM. Well, there might be different ways now. Um, I think many countries are also uh, moving on this track, also discussing with stakeholders uh, starting this month until end of the year before we start discussing, uh, negotiating the, the draft, the first draft of the GCM uh, for, for Thailand. We show us four uh, crucial provinces with different types of migrants, with different situations, with different reasons to be vulnerable. So it can also be issue-based and it also can be area-based. Uh, just an example, uh, Tak province, Tak province. That's the entry point where migrants from our neighboring countries move into. So the issue of human trafficking and smuggling and ethical recruitment starts there. So that's area-based vulnerability in Tak province. That's our first stakeholder meeting with IOM. We'll be hold it there. And that's actually the exit point where the mass exodus, exodus happened last month as well. So it's the entry point, the border crossing, Tak province. The second one <coughs> is Ranong province in the south. That's where the rubber plantations are. So that's about sustainability, about, sustain, uh, about jobs, about migrants having continuous uh, jobs and contributing to the economies. Uh, sustainability, that, that's one of the um, issues among the six issues. The other one is Samut Sakhon province. That's where the fishing industry is. 
that's where the issue of human rights and abuse should be discussed. So our stakeholder meeting in Sumutsakhan province, we would choose to focus area-based and uh, substance-wise to focus on human rights uh, issues. So it can also be area-based and, and issue-based. That, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. And the fourth um, stakeholder meeting that we'll have with IOM leading to the GCM in Thailand is in Bangkok. So that's where all the uh, hospitals, as I mentioned in the beginning, with uh, signage in Myanmar language, with uh, services provided to migrant labor are. are. So that, that's, that's probably one idea on how to insert uh, the vulnerability issue. Look at the area-based uh, as well. So just as, as one example. So finally, just to conclude, uh, the legal channels of complaint must be, must be there. I mean, I think for many countries, sometimes we overlook that the victims of abuse are often non-nationals. Non, non um, and sometimes, in, like in my country, we cannot distinguish uh, who's Thai national or not because we all look and speak the same uh, similar language. At the same time, victims of abuse, they're also, also victims of the law as well. What I'm talking about is the rule of law. <clears throat> The rule of law is related to development, of course, and the rule of law is law that is just. Sometimes we have laws, we have regulations, we have ministerial regulations that come about for our own good, national security, rule of law, enforcing it fully, but it causes a mass exodus, it causes uh, fear, it causes uh, an, an anxiety that does the country not want migrants anymore? Um, do, does the country not want to protect vulnerable migrants anymore? Uh, that's probably not the case. So the rule of law, a uh, law that is just to all groups, not only nationals, would be important, not just enforcing the law li literally. So I guess um, uh, I would say the law cannot be enforced literally per its term to um, widely varying circumstances. And we talk about vulnerability, that's a very widely varying circumstance. Uh, law cannot be enforced literally. I think there's something in Latin on that. Sumum jus summa injuria. So just finally to conclude that uh, situational and structural wise, each country would be different, but I guess our goal would be the same. Um, we could define vulnerability different, but I guess the track leading to that would be the same. And what's important is the dialogue and discussion inside the country, the stakeholders meeting that we're trying to embark on. I hope it's successful. Um, and all of this would of course be for the benefit of a society because a less vulnerable society, a healthy, I'm talking about, I talk about migrant, migrant health, a healthy migrant population means a healthy Thai population as well. So all of this is for the benefit of society, of economy, um, and of course we're talking about for the ben good benefit of humanity um, a a as well. And this includes um, the importance of, of, of migrants for, for every country as, as human beings as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have about 25 minutes for some discussion. Um, before I open the floor, I'll just remind the, the questions of the discussion that you all also have, the guiding questions for this panel. Um, how should the issues related to migrants and vulnerable situations be addressed in the GCM, the Global Compact? Um, the protection needs of different legally recognized categories, um, health determinants, can the assistance to vulnerable migrants framework address the, pre the protection needs of those who are falling out, and um, can the international community promote effective and coherent response uh, to protection of everybody regardless of their migration status or the context. Um, UNHCR had asked for the floor first. I might just abuse my role as um, moderator to quickly ask one question first directly to um, the representative from, from Thailand, please. You were saying that with the um, Labor Protection Act, you're working to ensure equal rights for all migrants. Does that extend then to, to workers in an irregular situation? Would they be able to enforce their labor rights un under the current framework in, in Thailand. Yes, um, unfortunately the Fifth Labor Protection <laughs> Act uh, is there for the purpose of um, helping migrants to access more so social services and, and for the protection in terms of health services and, and other, other rights as well as fighting against uh, child labor. So for irregular migrants, uh, it does not cover this yet. 
uh, this this issue yet. But in terms of the uh, addressing the uh, ends, addressing the effects of uh, you know what what they have been abused about, the system also caters to that, but not not through this particular act. So, for example, there are uh, uh, re re there are remedy and there are like. Uh, agencies that, that deal with uh, ir irregular, irregular migrants, even though this uh, law does not cover it, uh, in terms of uh, irregular migrants who are uh, uh, victims of human trafficking. Uh, the uh, Social Development Ministry has uh, shelters and uh, all the other services through a multidisciplinary team you know, with different agencies, meaning interior, labor, uh, health services as well, to, to, to address their, their needs as well. So, um, is there a representative from UNHCR who wanted the floor first? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I should say, perhaps, first of all, we're looking very much forward to hearing the views of states and other partners, of course. Um, nonetheless, thank you for giving us the floor, and thank you to all of the panellists for their extremely useful and concrete examples and insights into the challenges we face in this area. UNHCR agrees that a holistic approach, firstly to identifying and secondly to responding to the vulnerabilities of all persons on the move, is essential. To this end, we have sought over time to develop a number of tools to ensure that the immediate and the specific needs of all persons identified with vulnerabilities are met regardless of their status. We've developed these with the aim of assisting states, international partners, and civil society organizations, as well as other practitioners, in their efforts to identify and assist vulnerable people on the move. I'll mention three concrete examples among those available. Firstly, UNHCR's vulnerability screening tool, which was developed together with the International Detention Coalition and other partners in light of the severe operational exigencies which can live at interview time, for example, when individuals are in detention or when actors are forced to work remotely, including for security reasons. Secondly, UNHCR's heightened risk identification tool was, was developed to enhance efforts to identify refugees at risk by linking community-based assessments with individual assessment methodologies. Furthermore, in relation to children, UNHCR has developed a rapid best interest assessment form which can be used as soon as a child is identified as being separated, unaccompanied or otherwise at risk or with vulnerabilities in order to gather brief information spanning current care arrangements, protection and psychosocial needs, as well as education, health and security aspects. These resources and more, developed not only by UNHCR but by other partners, including states and organisations worldwide, are included in UNHCR's recently updated 10-point plan in action on refugee protection and mixed migration. We're ready to work with partners to develop further tools also to assist in these processes, in particular on focusing on identification of migrant and refugee vulnerabilities in diverse and challenging contexts. UNHCR recalls the importance of distinguishing between identifying and responding to those specific needs which migrants and refugees may share because they are in a vulnerable situation, because of situational or individual factors, and the need for international protection. As previously mentioned, persons in need of international protection, such as refugees, are entitled to protection against reformant or require permission to remain because of a serious threat to life, physical integrity or freedom as a result of persecution, armed conflict, violence or serious public disorder against which their country is unwilling or unable to protect them. Making the distinction between the need for international protection and responding to specific needs of migrants in vulnerable situations can help ensure that responses are targeted to the need of each individual, an important aspect which several panellists have also highlighted. UNHCR looks forward to continuing to work with IOM and other partners to improve ways to identify vulnerabilities and to meet the specific needs of all persons on the move. And we look forward to continuing to contribute this important work throughout the process of preparation for the Global Compact on Migration. Thank you. Thank you. So, can we hear from Morocco? Merci, uh, Madame la Présidente. Uh, tout d'abord, uh, je voudrais remercier l'OIM pour l'invitation et féliciter uh, l'équipe pour la qualité de l'organisation de ce dialogue. Merci également aux panélistes pour leur contribution fort intéressante. J'aurais trois commentaires à faire. Le premier, euh, 
toujours revenir pour attirer l'attention de ne pas coller l'étiquette vulnérable aux migrants. C'est dangereux parce qu'on voudrait véhiculer l'image que le migrant est un acteur qui contribue au développement des pays d'accueil, mais également de, de son pays d'origine. Euh, il ne faut pas, euh, à partir de là, le considérer comme un fardeau pour la société d'accueil qui doit le considérer comme un citoyen à part, à part entière. Et c'est une responsabilité de, 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 de cet état d'accueil, plus que la responsabilité, bien évidemment, du migrant lui-même qui doit faire preuve d'adaptation pour euh, s'intégrer dans la société d'accueil. À partir de là... Nous euh, parlerons moins des notions de protection et d'assistance, mais plutôt d'intégration et d'autonomisation. À titre d'exemple, les femmes, par exemple, qui sont particulièrement et abusivement euh, qualifiées de vulnérables, alors que leur autonomisation permet de libérer leur énorme potentiel et leur pouvoir de transformer toute la, toute la société. Deuxième commentaire, c'est ce dilemme qui a été rappelé par Peter Sutherland dans son rapport sur sa vision sur le pacte mondial pour les migrations. Ce dilemme consiste à ce que les États font face, euh, face aux migrants, doivent assumer des coûts immédiats euh, pour des bienfaits qui n'apparaîtront que plus tard. Et euh, alors que la prise en charge des migrants par les, les sociétés d'accueil doit être considérée comme un investissement à moyen et long terme pour parler des termes des termes plutôt économiques. Sinon, on prend le risque de les laisser euh, entre les mains d'autres investissements à court terme, cela dangereux pour ces mêmes sociétés en termes d'exploitation et de traite et euh, euh, d'exploitation également dangereuse par des, des réseaux criminels et terroristes. Troisième et dernier com commentaire, c'est la discrimination à l'accès aux services de base qui euh, rend les migrants vénérables, particulièrement au niveau de l'emploi. C'est toute la famille qui s'y vit les conséquences. D'où euh, la nécessité donc, de mettre à niveau les lois nationales pour garantir l'égalité à l'accès aux au, au services de base, notamment la préférence nationale qui existe dans beaucoup de pays euh, en, en termes d'accès à l'emploi. Des fois, sauter ce verrou de préférence nationale permet aux migrants d'accéder à des emplois durables, etc. Alors, le sous-emploi et l'emploi informel euh, exposent les migrants à la, à la fragilité, à la précarité. Je cite à titre d'exemple la crise économique de 2008, en Europe par exemple, qui a touché euh, en premier lieu les travailleurs migrants, et des travailleurs marocains en Europe, il y en a, il y en a beaucoup, et on l'a senti au niveau du Maroc, donc c'était les premiers à toucher par la crise, la, crise, la crise économique. Donc quand on perd son emploi, c'est toute une situation sociale qui est déstabilisée. Voilà donc la discrimination à l'accès aux services de base, c'est mon idée principale. Cette discrimination-là provoque ou engendre la vulnérabilité et on rentre dans un cercle vicieux. Merci. Lébia. Thank you, moderator. Actually, uh, the... Uh... My first uh, comment it, it actually goes to the first two panelists. The, the one from the Republic of Tanzania actually uh, did a great job, and, and, and I'm very much, uh, uh, very much admirable of, of the excellent presentation that she uh, had presented to us, uh, as well as the second panelist. And here, I wanted to focus on uh, the issue of vulnerability in, in the beginning. Um, I guess that migrants themselves, they are the ones who put themselves in the vulnerability situation from the beginning, from the irregular migratory path or route. Uh, let, them themse let themselves uh, be falling in the hands of smugglers and human traffickers, it is also a cause and it's a reason behind being in a, in, in a vulnerable situation. The second thing is, uh, the second point regarding the, uh, the differences or differentiations between um, migrants and refugees. 
I have to also endorse that because I've been saying that time and time again that usually refugees flee their homes uh, searching for shelter from a natural disaster or, or an armed conflict without a dream, without a plan, without a destination. What matters for them is to seek shelter. Whereas migrants, from the beginning, they leave their homelands with a dream, with a destination, and with a plan. I think this one should be taken into consideration. Now, finally, the solution, the durable solution to the vulnerability of migrants and, and, and seeking protection, gaining protection for their rights is one thing. It comes from the theme of the global compact that is endorsed by the New York Declaration. And how is it? The theme is, or the title of the compact is, a compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration. That means, obviously, that the migration which is unsafe is not acceptable. Migration that is out of order is not acceptable. Migration that is irregular is not acceptable once this document is adopted. I understand that unless somebody else understands something different because it's pretty obvious from the title, from the theme of the compact. So uh, we have to, in order to find s this solution for the vulnerability is to uh, make uh, migration safe, orderly, and regular. Thank you very much. Uh, Medicine Demand International Network. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, think, I think there is a large consensus that there is no predetermination of being vulnerable. You become vulnerable. We must answer the question why in 31 cities in Europe, 77% of our patients don't access health care. Why is it that 30% um, of our patients are restricting themselves to access health care because of fearing of being arrested? Why is it that 69% of our pregnant mothers in our consultations don't seek health care and don't have a single antenatal consultation? Those are the questions we must answer. So how? It seems that one of the observations um, that we came across is member states and the policies, of the migration policies, create an environment which is harmful for the migrants. And so it's a bit of a shift of a paradigm. Instead of looking into vulnerability criteria, the Global Compact on Migration should look first and foremost into how the policies at stake are harmful and violent for the migrants. I think this will prevent violence and harm to the migrant. And we'll look into not only about service provision, of course, migrants have specific needs, but it will go beyond those specific needs. It will help us create an environment without harm. For instance, we will look into ways not to check about research and rescue guidelines, but avoid migrants to endanger their life and take the sea. We will look into different situations. Instead of trying to protect children in retention centers, is to ban detention for the children. And instead of looking into a variety of care for the children, pregnant women and migrants in the healthcare system, it's about, as the, the, our, our colleague from Thailand, is ensuring that there is universal health care for all. It is about our Mr. Minister of Canada this morning is to ensure that they are safe and legal pathway for asylum. Thank you. Did I see? Sí, sí, gracias. El migrante no es, tampoco se hace. El migrante se enfrenta a un ambiente adverso generado por los estados y la sociedad. Quería hacer esta intervención y es muy breve porque he escuchado, aquí en el tema de migración hay mucha, muchos mitos, entonces hay que ir desmitificando ciertas cosas. Esta mañana el director adjunto de operaciones y, 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 de y de situaciones de emergencia de la OIM 
el señor Manzón decía que tenemos precisamente un marco jurídico internacional completo que lo que hace falta es el enlace entre la política y la práctica. Eso es un mito y eso es falso. También, y es respetable esa posición, como respetable la posición que tuvo hace un momento la delegada de Noruega diciéndonos que sí, que también estaba ese marco y que lo importante era no crear nuevas normas porque estas nuevas normas iban a debilitar las normas existentes. Pues las normas existentes, si las hay, están completamente debilitadas. Si, armamos, si hablamos de normativa a nivel internacional, lo más aproximado a una normativa internacional en el tema de las migraciones es precisamente la Convención Internacional para la Protección de los Derechos de los Trabajadores Migrantes y sus Familias. Pero resulta que prácticamente ninguno de los estados de destino la ha firmado. En pocas palabras, no sirve. Si funcionara lo que dijo esta mañana el delegado de la OIM, pues no se hubiese convocado esa gran conferencia en Nueva York y no se hubiese dado el mandato de negociar ese gran pacto mundial para una migración regular, ordenada y segura. Lo que sí es claro aquí es que nosotros debemos llevar a que estas negociaciones de este pacto tengan una identidad. Ese pacto debe tener una identidad con compromisos claros de todos de los estados, de destino y de, y, 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 y de origen, pero también de los organismos internacionales, del sector privado. ¿Sí? Entonces, empecemos a desmitificar esos mitos que le hacen daño a la migración. En el momento no hay una norma internacional que verdaderamente conlleve a unos flujos regulares, ordenados y seguros. Thank you, uh, Madam Facilitator. I will be very brief, and my comment uh, is directed to the uh, presenter from and the panelist from Tanzania. She has indicated that in Tanzania security is a priority, and to this end, I take it that to Tanzania migration is a security issue, or rather, security takes precedence over other migration considerations. If this is the case, how does Tanzania go about in reconciling security considerations and protection issues? I see the two security and the protection on extreme ends of the migration continuum. This is bearing in mind that uh, the GCM, which we are going to be discussing, will be uh, seeking among other issues to find a middle ground between the two issues, uh, security and protection. Thank you. Ethiopia. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I would also uh, like to thank the panelists. Uh, Madam, uh, while it is important to keep the distinction between uh, refugees and migrants, but very often times uh, the movements are of mixed nature. So my question to the panelists is how should the Global Compact on Migration address the concerns of the protection of migrants uh, in vulnerable situations in the case of mixed movements? I thank you. Um, we have Guatemala is back in the room, please. Muchas gracias, señora moderadora. Asimismo, agradecer a, a OIM por el documento de antecedentes en, en el cual vemos una, una primera diferenciación entre los distintos factores estructurales que, que nos llevan a, la, a situaciones de vulnerabilidad. Creemos que, que es necesario el fortalecimiento de la prevención de la migración irregular, la reintegración, la incidencia de la regularización migratoria, la protección consular especializada y diferenciada para los niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes y en general la atención, asistencia y protección de toda la población migrante. En el caso de Guatemala, la actual legislación tipifica y penaliza el delito de tráfico ilícito de personas. La Fiscalía de la Sección contra la Trata de Personas del Ministerio Público cuenta con unidades funcionales para la distribución de los casos en torno a diversas modalidades de delito de trata de personas, así como la designación de personal especializado para atender el tema de, de tráfico ilícito de migrantes. 
Es importante contar con unidades específicas que aborden estos temas, identificando las vulnerabilidades de las personas migrantes, no solo en tránsito, sino también en, las, en los países de destino. Muchas gracias. Um, I wrote... بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حياة الإغاثة الإسلامية العالمية نشكر الأخت لينينا كيف على تحت الفرصة حقيقة نحن كمنظمة دولية نعاني من نقص المعلومة حول المهجرين أو المهاجرين ننظر بعين الاعتبار أن تكون هناك منصة إلكترونية أو قاعدة بيانات تحتوي على الكم أو القدر الممكن من المعلومات تكون متاحة للمهاجر والباحث عن المعلومة عن هذا المهاجر أو المهجر حتى نستطيع القيام بواجبه حسب مكانته الاجتماعية توفر المعلومة يمنح الجميع الفرصة بالتعامل الإيجابي مع هذه الفئة من المجتمع فمن الأفضل أن تجمع هذه المعلومات في أوقات المتاحة مثل أوقات السلم قبل أو يكون هناك أرقام الوطنية لكل شخص بالإمكان الرجوع إلى قاعدة البيانات لكل دولة للحصول على هذه المعلومة وتكون ضمن منظمة الهجرة تتاح الفرصة للجميع للحصول على هذه المعلومة قدر الإمكان شكرا لكم I think Mauritius is the last. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Mauritius has a keen interest in regard to the issue of migration, the recognizing the importance of migration as a vehicle for development. We are actively participating to regional consultations on the Global Compact for Migration. At national level, we are currently working on the formulation of national, poli national migration policy, which will provide for an appropriate framework to address all issues relating to migration. We are very much concerned with all aspects pertaining to the preservation of human rights of migrants, especially as we are, are increasingly having recourse to um, foreign workers, and we ensure that they benefit from the same rights and facilities as our own citizens. However, we are often faced with challenges such as malpractices and abuses by recruiting agents, which even lead to cases of human trafficking. We already have, since 2009, enacted uh, our legislation on trafficking in persons, and we are currently working on a national action plan on trafficking in persons in consultation with all stakeholders. We have initiated procedures for the appointment of a migration service provider who will inter alia facilitate security and health screening for migrant workers and also monitor the management of compliances, compliance with international standards by recruitment agents. In spite of government's commitment to address such issues linked to vulnerable, vulner, vulnerabilities of migrants, we still find difficulties in dealing with such cases. We therefore welcome this initiative relating to a better understanding of vulnerabilities faced by migrants and look forward to the framework for the protection of different categories of migrants. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. I would like to answer the question about security. As you said, security is priority in the country. Yeah, immigration, uh, immigration department in Tanzania has a duty to facilitate and at the same time to control the movement of people, including vulnerable migrants, for the, uh, for the sake of the security and the economic interest and to make the country safe for everyone. Uh, even uh, by uh, uh, implementing these issues, then we have national, as I said before, and international laws which emphasize human rights so these vulnerable migrants are provided with protections and assistance, but that's why we say some of them fail to comply with the law in the countries. Some of them engage in the criminal offenses. So thus we have the duties and the responsibility, although we protect them, but we put priority security to make the country or places safe for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, we should close to move on to the next panel. We heard a lot of different practical examples really focusing around information provision, registries or other kinds of tools that could facilitate monitoring of rights.
um, implementing the existing norms and standards, the human rights framework, participation in governance procedures to actually involve migrants and migrant organisations, looking at the policy framework which actually causes the harm in which people that make migrants in situations where they're at risk of rights violations or violence or exploitation. Um, and regular channels looking at why people are taking, embarking on unsafe routes and making sure those regular channels are also decent and promoting uh, a safe migration once in the country. Thanks very much to everybody and uh, we'll move to the next panel.